Very good. Let's all turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 13. Tonight, as I was saying, I do have a brief... Uh, I actually, I have a follow-up and uh, an update to the message I preached three Sundays back related to the uh, this present social and economic siege that we're under. Actually, that the entire world has been placed under by the devil's globalist cabal. And while much of the world is waking up to the fact that this present crisis is really the uh, the result of a planned and a well-orchestrated global fraud that has been perpetrated upon it via this alleged pandemic. Obviously, there is a virus going around and affecting some rather drastically, but the flu always does that for some. Besides uh, the fact that the world is waking up to the fraud, Donald Trump continues to show his true colors as with just about every other promise Trump made to convince the voters he was an outsider, like that he was going to drain the swamp and oppose abortion and end the military occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan, all these things he promised. He also, uh, before his election, he made some very anti-vaccine statements that he was against vaccinations. But now he has also flip-flopped from that, from those statements that he made prior to his election. He is now pushing, of course, the Bill Gates... Anthony Fauci, mandatory vaccine agenda into high gear. Trump is doing that. He recently announced a project that's called Operation Warp Speed. Operation Warp Speed. It wasn't a general announcement, but it was covered by a few publications like Bloomberg and others. Um, He had said before he was elected several times, he talked about the link between the number of vaccines children get in early infancy and the development of autism. For example, in, on March 28th, 2014, he posted this tweet to his page. He said, healthy young child goes to doctor, gets pumped with massive shot of many vaccines, doesn't feel good, and changes. Autism. Many such cases. And this is how, you know, he won the hearts of those that see all this wickedness, and voted for him. That's how he did that. A lot of these things he said he would do, support the Constitution, Second Amendment, all these things. But he flip-flopped on all these things, and... He's showing his true colors again. So here, uh, according to this recent Bloomberg article, states as follows, the Trump administration is organizing a Manhattan Project-style effort. The Manhattan Project, of course, was when they developed the atomic bomb. Organizing a Manhattan Project-style effort to drastically cut the time needed to develop a coronavirus vaccine with the goal of making enough doses for most Americans by year's end. 300 million doses, in fact, he wants by the year's end. Called Operation Warp Speed, the program will pull together private pharmaceutical companies, government agencies, and the military, and the military, to try to cut the development time for a vaccine by as much as eight months, according to two people familiar with the matter. It says, as part of the arrangement, taxpayers will shoulder much of the financial risk that vaccine candidates may fail instead of drug companies. So the taxpayers are going to be paying for bad drugs that go bad, not the drug companies. Project's goal is to have 300 million doses of vaccine available by January, according to one administration official. There's no precedent for such development, rapid development of a vaccine. Uh, my, my belief is that they've already developed the vaccine. Fauci already has several patents on many vaccines. And uh, my guess is it's already been developed. Bill Gates has also several patents on several vaccines. Uh, but at the same time, listen to this. There's, you may not have heard this. This is from Israel, from a Jerusalem Post uh, article that was published just this last Friday, May 8th. The headline, Benjamin Netanyahu suggests microchipping kids, slammed by experts. This is, the, uh, this is how it reads. Cyber experts slammed Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for his proposal to microchip children who return to schools and kindergartens as the coronavirus lockdown is lifted yet reported on Friday. So they've got the same lockdown over in Israel, and he wants to microchip the children before they can go back to school. Mm-hmm. While speaking at a press conference on Monday, Netanyahu suggested the health ministry use new technology to help Israel adjust to its new routine, a new routine as the state is lifting the coronavirus lockdown. Uh, quote, that is technology that has not been used before and is allowed under the legislation we shall enact says Netanyahu. 
Uh, quote, he said, I spoke with our heads of technology in order to find measures Israel is good at, such as sensors. For instance, every person, every kid, I want it on kids first, says Netanyahu. I want it on kids first, he says. Would have a sensor that would sound an alarm when you get too close, like the ones in cars, the prime minister said. So this is new social, social distancing uh, enforcement. You put chips in kids so that when they get close to each other, the buzzer sounds off. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? And that's brilliant. Yeah, that's just absolutely brilliant. These are the, this is the reprobate minds that these Satanists have been turned over to. Just absolutely ridiculous. So one uh, cyber expert didn't like the idea, but only because it'll be hard to do it to more than a million school children who return to their educational institutions in order to ensure one student sits at the distance of two meters from another, they said. Theoretically, I get the idea behind it, this cyber expert said. But although such a distance-sensitive microchips exist in vehicles, it's different in humans. This goes on, and it says, if the information with the kid's location is uploaded to the Internet, a pedophile with some cyber knowledge may invade the system and stalk them outside their schools, follow them, and distribute the information on other platforms. Can the state take responsibility for that? The Prime Minister's office added that the Prime Minister's suggestion is an idea that may help maintain social distancing. And there will not be any violation of privacy. Oh, we're just going to microchip kids. No invasion of privacy. Yeah. The point is, this is even being suggested. And Netanyahu says, I want this on school children first. The wickedness of this whole thing. And this is the result of this coronavirus epidemic, so-called this pandemic. So, in hearing these things, you know, it appears quite true to me, appears to me that no one in government has any intention of ever restoring even the limited level of freedom and liberty that existed before this COVID-19 hoax was forced upon the world. That really this is going to be the new normal. It does appear. Carol Ann also the other day sent me a, a video, a 17-minute video of American police arresting a man because he was not social distancing properly and the police came in his home and said he's not behaving himself properly and they arrested him. That's going on in America today. And so while Mr. Trump is ramping up to warp speed the production of enough doses of alleged immunizations to vaccinate every American by year's end, and uh, Bibi Netanyahu, you know, John Hagee's hero, says school kids going, but can't go back to work, can't go back to school until they've been microchipped. Every person, every kid. I want it on kids first, he says. So they're ramping up these efforts, though, while... Much of the world is waking up to the fact that this crisis is, for the most part, the result of a planned and well-orchestrated global fraud. And so the main point of my message tonight to you guys is we're going to have to, in our day, each one of us, learn to resist the wickedness that's going on in the government. We're all going to be placed in a situation where we're going to have to resist. And we need to know, of course, all of us, what the Bible says. We're also living in a day when, just as it was done in Nazi Germany, Romans 13 is being cited by preachers and by others as well. In Nazi Germany, Christians in, in Germany were told that, hey, Romans 13 says you have to obey everything the government says. And there are many churches preaching the exact same thing, that you have to obey everything, every command the government says. And so, in talking about biblical law, usually the first element of deception that we have to dispel is the typical Christian's misunderstanding of his duty to the civil authority. And I've gone over this ground many times before. I just want to review tonight for all of you, for maybe some who weren't here when we've talked, covered it before. So due to this prevalent false teaching that the, that the Christian is duty-bound to obey whatever the government says, that Romans 13 requires unconditional obedience of every ordinance of man, period. Or that whenever we're confronted by government, uh, such as at a traffic stop, when the police officer is asking for permission to search our vehicle, that you can't say no, you got to let him do it. That we're just supposed to be nice and do whatever the government says because that's what Romans 13 tells us to do. But that is not at all, as most of us know, what Romans 13 says. Paul says Romans 13, verse 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. 
that is a mouthful of theology in that one verse. But we, uh, we need to notice what it does say and what it does not say. And first of all, this verse does not say that all government rulers or all government systems or all laws are from God, like some want to claim this verse says. And it does not teach that anyone is to give unlimited, unconditional obedience to the civil government. In other words, this verse is not saying that every government official or despotic tyrant that finds himself in political power was put there by God. It doesn't mean that all laws are ordained by God. It doesn't mean that all forms of government are ordained by God. And it doesn't mean that Christians are to do whatever the government tells them to do. We need to understand that only God deserves unconditional obedience. Another very important principle is that to whomever you do give unlimited submission and unconditional obedience, that is your God. The Bible clearly states, by the way, that all rulers are not from God. I heard had a man today again tell me that, well, you know, God put Donald Trump in power and he thinks he's going to use Donald Trump to do what he needs to do. Well, don't blame God for Donald Trump being in power. You know, blame the people that voted for him. All rulers are not from God. We read in Hosea, you can write this down, Hosea 8, verse 1 through 4, says, set the trumpet to thy mouth. In other words, blow the trumpet because the enemy is coming, is what that means. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord because they have transgressed my covenant. God's pronouncing a judgment upon Israel. They've transgressed my judge, my covenant, transgressed against my law. Uh, Israel shall cry to me, verse 2, my God, we know thee. Israel hath cast off the, the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. God says in verse 4 of Hosea chapter 8, this is why he says he's sending judgment. They have set up kings, but not by me, says God. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Of their silver and gold have they made them idols, that they may be cut off. God says, all kings are not from him. Israel set up kings, but not by, me, by him. And so the Bible does not teach that all rulers are put in power by God. Uh, but on the other hand, we do read in the Bible that quite often God does put down one ruler and raises up another. And that was true not only in Israel. Remember, remember in Daniel chapter 4, we read there in Daniel chapter 4 that Nebuchadnezzar had to recognize that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And until Nebuchadnezzar recognized that, he was made to eat grass like a cow. And so he finally recognized that. But in general, uh, God allows people to choose their own civil rulers, and then he holds those civil rulers accountable to his law, to how they executed his law among the people that they govern. Just, by the way, as he did in Israel, when the people said to Samuel, we want a king to rule over us. In chapter 12, Samuel said, here's your king that you've, that you've raised up. You asked for him. Basically said it was wrong for you to do so. And the Lord's going to judge you for that. He said, but be sure that you obey the Lord or both you and your king will perish. And so we can't blame God for putting Donald Trump in office or anybody else. All rulers are not from God. All laws are not from God. God, by the way, did not invent Nazism or communism or fascism. Romans 13, again, does not authorize all civil government. To the contrary, it's actually a statement, a great statement, wonderful statement of limited government. It is a declaration, actually, of the limitations that God himself places on civil government. The Bible says that God is our only lawgiver. Isaiah 33, verse 22 says, For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. We also know that James says in James 4.12, There is one lawgiver, one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Here art thou that judgeth another. The Bible says that our laws are supposed to come from God. He is our only lawgiver. And therefore, because God is our lawgiver, the phrase here, there is no power but of God. Also means that there is no legitimate law but God's law. And all laws of men 
must be in conformity and in accordance with God's law. All civil laws must either arise out of or at least be in subjection to in conformity with God's law as revealed in God's word, the Bible. That phrase, there is no power but of God, is a great statement that the civil government cannot make up its own power. That's why we have to see this. It's a limitation on civil government that it cannot make up its own power. Amen. It means that God writes the rules in his universe. The creator of the universe is sovereign over every single one of his creatures. And no man and no group of men has any authority to write laws that contravene the laws of God. Civil government has no authority to go beyond what God has given it and how he has defined it in his sole singular revelation to man, which is the Bible. Romans 13 does not give civil government carte blanche to do whatever it wants. In fact, it does the opposite. It limits the civil government to only doing what God wants it to do. And that's clear from the context here. Paul is speaking here of good government, not tyrannical. All right. Paul is saying here that every Christian should have no problem obeying the civil government because civil government, legitimate, lawful civil government, can only do what God tells it to do, what God allows it to do. That's why we read in verse 3, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Paul says, Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? That means the civil authority. Do that which is good, and thou shalt have the praise of the same. Verse 4 says, For he is a minister of God to thee for good. Well, doesn't the Bible say, 2 Timothy chapter 3, that all God's ministers are to be fully equipped by the Word of God, thoroughly furnished by the Word of God? Yes, it does. If they're God's ministers, they're only to be furnished and thoroughly equipped by the Word of God. He's a minister of God to thee for good, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is a minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So, we can conclude here that civil rulers are only ministers for good, as, as he says here in verse 4, when they are ministers for God. He's a minister of God to thee for good. They're only ministers for good when they're ministers for God. And when rulers cease being God's ministers to us for good, and instead of being a terror to evil works, they become a terror to good works. They forbid Christians to go to church, etc., and they begin to pass bad laws that contravene the scriptures. They have then usurped power not granted by God. They are operating in opposition to God. And at that point, they must be resisted by God's people. That's what the Bible says about civil authority throughout, from Genesis to Revelation. That's what God's, God's word declares about the Christian's duty to the civil authority. Yes, Peter says in 1 Peter 2, verse 13, that we are to submit ourselves to every ordinance of man. He qualifies that exhortation, though. He says, for the Lord's sake. We're to submit ourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. And a Christian is forbidden, for the Lord's sake, to submit to evil or to allow evil laws that violate God's laws to prevail. We can't do that for the Lord's sake. Which is why the same Peter that said we're to submit ourselves to every ordinance of man in 1 Peter 2.13 he also said in Acts 5.29 with the Apostle John that we must obey God rather than men. St. Peter said made both of those statements. And we all know that the Bible is filled with stories of courageous men and women of God who resisted wicked rulers to obey God instead from the midwives in Egypt who refused to obey Pharaoh's edict to murder the baby Hebrew boys. Of course, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who said to Nebuchadnezzar, we talked about it a couple weeks ago, we'll burn before we'll bow. They said, Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Paul says in Romans 12, verse 18, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And he says in Hebrews 12, verse 14, Follow peace with all men, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. 
And we as Christians should do all that we can to live peaceably and to uphold and to defend the Constitution, defend the laws of the land, the righteous laws of this land, those that are in accordance with God's law. And the Bible clearly says that Christians are to submit to the civil authority, but only to the extent that the civil authority submits to God. Well, that is what God's Word declares about our duty to the civil authority. Turn to Daniel chapter 11. Once again, when rulers, again, I'll say it again, when rulers cease being God's ministers to us for good, and instead of being a terror to evil works, they become a terror to good works. And good people end up being terrorized by the government, afraid of the government and what they're going to do. And they begin to pass bad laws that we have to take as, as dangerous vaccination filled with this poison serum, much of which is made from aborted baby body parts. And they want to inject that into everybody. When they begin to pass these bad laws that everyone has to get microchipped, everyone has to have your money in their, in their banks in order to operate in commerce, they have then usurped powers not granted by God they're operating in opposition to God and must be resisted. And the point here, again, the reason I'm bringing this message tonight is that days are now upon us when we as Christians are going to have to refuse. Each one of us are going to be faced with an opportunity to resist because we're going to all be confronted with bad laws. And we're all going to have to take a stand on these truths. We need to know them well. We have to resist all so-called laws that forbid us to assemble as a church or that require us to be microchipped, marked, or injected with these poison serums that the government calls mandatory. And we must be willing to pay whatever price comes from that opposition, which may well, for us, include actually being arrested and placed in a quarantine prison camp. might come to that. We need to realize these things. And by the way, the Bible actually shows us here in Daniel chapter 11 that there will indeed be resistance from God's people to the Antichrist when he forces the devil's agenda on a global scale, as is being done now, by the way. As we've talked about in time past, preterist and historicist commentaries like those by John Gill and Albert Barnes try to tell us uh, that this chapter here in Daniel was fulfilled centuries ago by Antiochus Epiphanes in the time between the Testaments. But repeating, as we pointed out several times in prior messages, including in our challenge to Chuck Baldwin, that he, of course, never answered. The context of Daniel chapter 12 shows us beyond doubt that the preceding events of chapter 11 could in no way have been fulfilled at any time in ancient history. Chapter 12 begins with these words. Daniel 12, verse 1, And at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. Those words identify the time spoken of here as the very same time the Lord Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24, verse 21, when he quoted from this very verse, saying, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. So the time of tribulation, this time of trouble spoken of here, could not possibly have been fulfilled by Antiochus Epiphanes, first because the Lord Jesus said that the time was still future in his day. Further, this time of trouble uh, could also in no way have been fulfilled by Rome's destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, as preterist historicists try to imagine. First, because that time of trouble in AD 70 was not at all a time like no other before or since, as it was basically a replay of the siege and the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. Also then, continuing with Daniel 12, verse 1, the angel then told Daniel, And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So Daniel's people here means Israel, it means the Jews, by the way, Israel was decimated in AD 70, not delivered. And further, we then read in verse 2, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. 
And so again, this passage states clearly that the time of trouble we read of here is a time that is unparalleled in history, a time when Daniel's people Israel will be delivered, as we also see, by the way, back in Zechariah chapters 12 to 14. And we also see that this takes place at or near the time of the final resurrection. And then, of course, that fact is further emphasized here in verse 3, where the angel says, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. And so what we're reading about here is the, is the time of the end, just prior to the final resurrection and judgment. And repeating the, uh, the opening words there, at verse 1, the angel said to Daniel, at, And at that time, at what time? At the time the preceding events of chapter 11 are taking place. And so that brings the latter half, actually, of Daniel chapter 11, beginning actually in verse 21, right up to the present era, to this age. And in this passage, we see described the tyrannical reign of a wicked king called a vile person who can be none other than that man of sin and son of perdition that Paul spoke of and that John spoke of as the Antichrist. And we see beginning in verse 32 that his tyranny is resisted and opposed by God's people. Daniel 11:32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. By the way, that phrase, do exploits, literally means that they will take action, that they will take a stand. They will not be corrupted or submit to the Antichrist tyrannical laws. But we also see here, as we see in John's revelation, that they will suffer persecution. Verse 33, And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil, many days. Verse 34, Now when they shall fall, they shall be helping with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries, or that means with insincerity. Verse 35, And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end because it is yet for a time appointed. So this passage says that there will be resistance to the Antichrist's evil reign. The people that know their God will not submit to his evil decrees. And it also says they're going to be aided and assisted by others who are not necessarily Christian. They join with them with insincerity. And so, speaking of resistance, a couple of days ago, I want to share this with you. This is another development I want to bring to your attention. A couple of days ago, I got a very interesting piece of information. And uh, this was from uh, a listener in the UK who forwarded me by email a public appeal for sanity, basically, for global recognition that the pandemic is an overblown hoax. And this appeal is actually being made by several Roman Catholic bishops uh, that apparently don't agree with the assessment posted to the world by the Jesuit Superior General the Black Pope that I shared with you guys a couple weeks ago. Remember when the Jesuit Superior General said that we must all accept the, the measures and sacrifices that allow us to contribute to the good of all. So we're supposed to accept the social distancing and being forced to wear masks in public or on the job or being told when we can't travel freely or leave our homes for the good of all. Remember he said that. And then he said, remember how we can turn this crisis into permanent, not temporary, and reactionary change, as he said, remember, don't forget this is not an accident. This COVID-19 is the fruit of how human beings have misunderstood and made their home relationship. And it's confirmation of our mission to collaborate, to contribute to change of this world. And remember, he says, we are dreaming uh, to just live how we were before the virus came to our lives. But that's the great lesson. So uh, to take opportunity of this crisis to be aware that something has to change. We have to change. And basically talking about, you know, this is going to change the whole world and we're never going back the way it used to be. And, of course, Pope Francis, the white pope, of course, also known as Orhe Bergoglio, a Marxist, uh, he's also lining up with the globalist agenda. He said this, the coronavirus pandemic is one of nature's responses to humans ignoring the current ecological crisis. Nature's response to humans ignoring the ecological crisis. Also, two weeks ago, he said by open letter, it was his Easter letter, uh, that this COVID-19 crisis gives the world a good reason to implement a universal basic wage for all the poor and downtrodden global citizens. 
pure Marxism. This is what the Pope says. I'm going to read this just a brief excerpt from Pope Francis's open Easter letter to what he called world popular movements. In other words, socialist movements, Marxist movements. The Pope said, uh, Now in the midst of this pandemic, I think of you in a special way in which to express my closeness to you, the poor people of the world downtrodden. In these days of great anxiety and hardship, many have used warlike metaphors to refer to the pandemic. And then he says, If the struggle against COVID-19 is a war, then you are truly an invisible army, fighting in the most dangerous trenches, an army whose only weapons are solidarity, hope, and community spirit, all revitalizing at a time when no one can save themselves alone. He says, I know that you uh, nearly never received the recognition that you deserve, talking to the poor people of the world, the downtrodden, because you are truly invisible to the system. Market solutions do not reach the peripheries, and state protection is hardly visible there, nor do you have the resources to substitute for its functioning. You are looked upon with suspicion when, through community organization, you try to move beyond philanthropy, or when, instead of resigning and hoping to catch some crumbs that fall from the table of economic power, you claim your rights. I would say that Karl Marx would be very proud of his student there. That's very Marxist thought, is it not? He continues, My hope is that governments understand that technocratic paradigms, whether state-centered or market-driven, are not enough to address the crisis or the great problems affecting humankind. He's talking to the poor people again. I know that you have been excluded from the benefits of globalization. You do not enjoy the superficial pleasures that, an that anesthetize so many consciences. Yet you always suffer from the harm they produce. You have no steady income to get you through this hard time. And the lockdowns are becoming unbearable. He says, this may be the time to consider a universal basic wage, which would acknowledge and dignify the noble, essential tasks that you carry out. So we need to level everybody out, give everybody a universal wage, and it's pure, pure Marxism. And so we should take advantage of this crisis to basically have a Marxist revolution here. I guess is what he's suggesting. But as I mentioned, uh, there are several Roman Catholic bishops, bishops, priests, and theologians in the Catholic Church that, that apparently do not at all agree with the assessment of the Jesuit superior general and that have come together to call out the pandemic for the fraud that it is and actually to issue a call for resistance to the very measures that the Jesuit general says that we're supposed to accept. So I'm putting this up on the screen for you guys all to see. Of course, being a Roman Catholic document, the appeal, I guess, has to have a picture at the top of the Catholic goddess Ashtoreth, Queen of Heaven, who they renamed Mary and continue to worship because they don't really know the true God. But here, as foretold in Daniel 11, they're helping those of us that do about getting past that bit of Catholic idolatry. This appeal then contains the following very powerful language. That is right on. And I'm going to read this thing. It's worth reading. It's not, not all that long, but I, I want you to see what these guys are saying. The appeal for the church and the world to Catholics and all people of goodwill. In this time of great crisis, we pastors of the Catholic Church, by virtue of our mandate, considered our sacred duty to make an appeal to our brothers in the episcopate, to the clergy, to religious, to the holy people of God, and to all men and women of goodwill, this appeal has also been undersigned by intellectuals, doctors, lawyers, journalists, and professionals who agree with its content and may be undersigned by those who wish to make it their own. The facts have shown that under the pretext of the COVID-19 pretext, the COVID-19 epidemic, the inalienable rights of citizens have in many cases been violated and their fundamental freedoms, including the exercise of freedom of worship, expression, and movement, have been disproportionately and unjustifiably restricted. Public health must not and cannot become an alibi for infringing on the rights of millions of people around the world, let alone for depriving the civil authority of its duty to act wisely for the common good. This is particularly true as growing doubts emerge from several quarters about the actual contagiousness, danger, and resistance of the virus. Many authoritative voices in the world of science and medicine confirm that the media's alarmism about COVID-19 appears to be absolutely unjustified. We have reason to believe on the basis, now this is, you know, a bunch of Catholic bishops. Reason to believe on the basis of official data on the incidence of the epidemic as related to the number of deaths, that there are powers interested in creating panic among the world's population with the sole aim of permanently imposing unacceptable forms of restriction on freedoms, of controlling people, and of tracking their movements. 
The imposition of these, Ill, of these illiberal measures is a disturbing prelude to the realization of a world government beyond all control. Is that amazing or not, coming from these Catholic bishops? We also believe that in some situations, the containment measures that were adopted, including the closure of shops and businesses that precipitated the crisis, has brought down entire sectors of the economy. This encourages interference by foreign powers and has serious social and political repercussions. Those with governmental responsibility must stop these forms of social engineering by taking measures to protect their citizens whom they represent and whose interests they have a serious obligation to act. Likewise, let them help the family, the self-society, by not unreasonably penalizing the weak and elderly, forcing them into a painful separation from their loved ones. The criminalization of personal and social relationships must be likewise judged as an unacceptable part of the plan of those who advocate isolating individuals in order to better manipulate and control them. This is very well stated. I mean, this is powerful. I agree with just about everything this thing says. We ask the scientific community to be vigilant so that cures for COVID-19 are offered in honesty for the common good, not forced vaccination, in other words. Every effort must be made to ensure that shady business interests like Bill Gates and Anthony Fauci do not, inter, do not influence the choices made by government leaders and international bodies. It's unreasonable to penalize those remedies that have proved to be effective and are often inexpensive just because one wishes to give priority to treatments or vaccines that are not as good, but which guarantee pharmaceutical companies far greater profits and exacerbate public health expenditures. Let's also remember as pastors that for Catholics it is morally unacceptable to develop or use vaccines derived from material from aborted fetuses. This is really good stuff. We ask all government leaders to ensure that forms of control over people, whether through tracking systems or any other forms of location finding, are rigorously avoided. The fight against COVID-19, however serious, must be not be the pretext for supporting the hidden intentions of supranational bodies that have very strong commercial and political interest in this plan. In particular, citizens must be given the opportunity to refuse these restrictions on personal freedom. It says, uh, We are called to assess the current situation in a way consistent with the teaching of the gospel. That's the Catholic gospel. This means taking a stand, either with Christ or against Christ. Let us not be intimidated or frightened by those who would have us believe that we are a minority. Good is much more widespread and powerful than the world would have us believe. We are fighting against an invisible enemy that seeks to divide citizens, to separate children from their parents, their grandchildren from their grandparents, the faithful from their pastors, students from teachers, and customers from vendors. Let us not allow centuries of Christian civilization to be erased under the pretext of a virus and an odious technological tyranny to be established in which nameless and faceless people can decide the fate of the world by confining us to a virtual reality. If this is the plan to which the powers of this earth intend to make us yield, know that Jesus Christ, King and Lord of history, has promised that the gates of hell shall not prevail. So to this point, this appeal is very well stated and shows that even within the Roman Catholic Church, there are many who see the fraud of this global pandemic and who also see somewhat, at least, where all this is going, which is the soon-to-be-fulfilled global government of the Antichrist. Uh, But then, however, these bishops unfortunately had to ruin this document with more idolatrous worship of their virgin goddess Ashtoreth as follows. With faith, they say, let us beseech the Lord to protect the church and the world. May the Blessed Virgin, help of Christians, cross the head of the ancient serpent and defeat the plans of the children of darkness. So they close that thing in Mary's name rather than Jesus' name. And here's a whole list of folks that have signed this thing. This is issued from Rome. Last week, May 8th, there's a list of several of the the bishops from all over the world that have signed this onto this thing, and uh, lawyers, uh, journalists, writers, doctors, immunologists, uh, virologists, etc. So interesting there, very interesting development. Again, to put that in perspective, lest anyone be fooled by what sounds like very Christian language there, and as a reminder, Roman Catholicism, of course, is counterfeit Christianity. The Lord Jesus Christ of the Catholic Church, we know, is another Jesus, not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Catholic Church has to be crucified afresh and anew every time the Mass is said. 
because his one-time death on the cross was not sufficient to atone for all of our sin. The Jesus of the idolatrous Catholic Church has no problem with having his earthly mother elevated to the position of a goddess who stands as mediator between God and man and who fights for Catholics to crush the serpent's head and defeat the plans of the children of darkness. Much to the contrary, we know our salvation is in the blood of Jesus alone, who alone is our only mediator and who alone is the one who crushes the serpent's head. However, nevertheless... They had a lot of good things to say in this that are right on and uh, need to be heard. And so I do see this development as being very interesting. In fact, it's actually not at all unlike what took place during World War II when many Catholic priests actually disagreed with Pope Pius XII's silence and his acquiescence uh, to Hitler's atrocities. And they resisted the Nazis and they were imprisoned in concentration camps for doing so, where many Catholic priests were tortured and lost their lives for their resistance. Pope Pius XII actually has been labeled as Hitler's Pope. He was a Nazi sympathizer who never publicly criticized Hitler or the Nazis for their well-known mass murder, extermination, and euthanasia uh, campaigns that, by the way, were carried out not only against Jews, but also against whoever was deemed racially unfit by the Nazis. Uh, The senile, the mentally handicapped, mentally ill, epileptics, cripples, children with Down syndrome, and people with similar afflictions, they were all supposed to be killed. And ultimately, aside from Jews, 70,000 unfit people were killed in that way. And various Catholic bishops, priests, and theologians pressed Pope Pius XII to speak out, and he declined, he refused to do so. For instance, on one occasion, more than 1,000 Jews were rounded up in Rome on October 16th, 1943, held for two days next to the Vatican, right next door to the Vatican before they were deported to their death camps. And Pius was again urged by the bishops to speak out, but he decided not to publicly protest or even privately privately send a plea to Hitler not to send these Jews to their deaths. But on the other hand, one-third of German Catholic priests faced some form of reprisal from authorities and thousands of Catholic clergy and religious were sent to concentration camps. There were over 2,500 Catholic priests imprisoned in the, in the clergy barracks at Dachau, and more than a 1,000 of those were put to death. And so uh, here again, I just find it interesting that many Catholic bishops are now standing up to call out this alleged pandemic for what it is, and to rightly say that this evil should be resisted. However, while it's good to hear of such resistance rising up from other quarters, which again is, I believe, in accordance with the very type of resistance that we saw prophesied in Daniel 11, my opinion is that the powers that be really don't care (laughs) who wakes up, because they control everything. They control the global economy and the global mass media and the governments of this world. They control the opinion of by far the greater majority of the people in this world. Paul calls them in Ephesians 6, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places, and that means, I believe, the high places of civil government. Those powers have zero intention of ever restoring the limited level of freedom and liberty that existed before this COVID-19 hoax was forced upon the world. This will be the new normal, as they say. But I would add that that's just for a short time until our Lord returns. This present crisis has been wholly created by those very same powers that be and will indeed and very soon, I believe, lead to eventual fulfillment and implementation of the mark of the beast, Revelation 13. But for us, the message of the Bible is that we are to resist wicked laws that would in any way compromise our subjection to Jesus Christ as our one and only Lord. And that includes our Lord's commands for us to meet together, to exhort and to encourage one another, and also to preach the gospel to the lost. Any and all social distancing laws, to the contrary, notwithstanding. Once again, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we must say to the wicked king, our God is able to save us from the fire. But even if he chooses not to, we will still not bow. We will resist and we'll burn before we'll bow. And even if we do have to go through the fire, 
we know that we still have nothing to fear because our loving Lord will go through that fire with us. As we read in Isaiah chapter 43, Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I had that to share with you guys tonight. I want to open up for comments, questions, uh, anything that you guys want to say about this or anything else.